So it's a pleasure, and I want to thank Jorge and Bruno and Marco for inviting me for this. So Bruno was my PhD co-advisor. Jean-Pierre Fuchs sitting there was my main advisor. And this work I did during my PhD and after as well. And I want to sh tell you the story of the how I found out about this functional ethyl calculus, or maybe we should start calling Dupier calculus at some point. And, and so a bit of history, and then I'll go through the theory and just some applications that Bruno did, and later a contribution. So I think in Brazil, at least, the first time Bruno spoke about this was in Rio 2008. The first time I attended the Researching, Researching Options Conference was in 2007. And I would, I don't know, when I was here, I was, had just like learned the usual ETO calculus. So I was in the first year of my master's and seeing the functional ETO calculus, here have the abstract that Bruno submitted. It was quite amazing. Like, I remember people during the talk, like, like, can this be true? Like, people wouldn't like believe the, that you could do whatever you were doing with the usual ETO calculus in a functional sense. And that's what I'm gonna show you in the next slides. So it's a way of generalizing ETO calculus to take care of uh, path dependence. You find out like many of the theorems and results still holds. And, uh, and as Bruno says, it was like a hammer made to, like, to use on a specific nail. And the nail was the to the study this decomposition of the Vega and to study the risk, the, how the option depends on the volatility if the option is path dependent. So this is the group picture. You see Bruno here, Mateus, a lot of people, and I'm here. So it was a very nice conference. It was in Younger this year. So George is here. So. This was the next conference in Brazil that Bruno spoke about this. We had more time to chat about the possibility of a PhD on this topic. It was in Marizia, Sao Paulo. It was also a very nice conference on this. And so as a motivation for the theory, and I hope to show you like uh, how this came like how do we want to do like path dependence? Why we want this? So the usual ETO calculus, it's a calculus of uh, the functions that depend on the current value. You get the, func the ETO formula here. We'll see the functional ETO version of this. And other than the usual fundamental theorem of calculus, you get the second derivative term that is because of the Cordial variation. We'll see the same thing in the in the functional ETO calculus framework. And the point, the main point, is that the WT here is the current value of the Brownian motion in this case, could be more general than this. And the way we want to generalize is to consider <coughs> like w, uh, the path of WT up to time t. So why we want this, as in Bruno's paper, he says often the impact of randomness is cumulative and depends on the history of the process. So you have many examples. Georgi mentioned Julian's uh, work, or like before that, Hobson and Rogers, of the volatility of the stock depending on the history, or at least the recent history, of the price of the stock. Uh, the main example in, in quantitative finance we have is the, is the exotic options with path dependency. So the Asian options, the barrier options, and you can go out the realm of quantitative finance. There are like recent works on, uh, still on stochastic analysis, but closer to biology nowadays on like applying functional ethical calculus. Two other examples I wrote here, but there are like many, many more is like maybe you want to model temperature in a certain location. This for sure depends on the history of the the temperature or the weather in that location. And the credit score of some, someone may depend on the history of the, 
of the payments and other types of information that person has. So how can we deal with this? How can we do stochastic calculus or even like usual calculus? I will mention a bit about this. How can you do this for functionals, for things that depend on the, on the path? So I'm following Bruno's seminal paper here on functional calculus, published on SSRN uh, in 2009. The work is before that, the, the, the talk was 2008. And I'm, I'll follow his notation. So we have here some basic definitions. So Lambda t here is just Cadillac paths. We need jumps, and you'll see why. And the space of paths, one way of modeling this is the union of all these Cadillac paths from zero t with the domain fixed. And we take the union, so you consider paths of different time domains. And the notation is very important, and I hope you can follow. If you have any questions, just let me know is that capital letters will be used to denote paths. So capital XT is the path of the process or, or the path of X from zero to T. And the lowercase letter XS is the value of that path at time S at the specific point S, okay? So this notation, I think the, the good thing about it is that you can like, Somehow it's a fine line between thinking that you are in the Ito classical calculus and knowing that you're not in the Ito classical calculus. But this fine line is, it, it's okay because usually most of the results that hold in the classical setting holds in the functional setting. So if you, that was not the case, it would be like, a, probably should change it, but it's okay here. And to compare paths, we're gonna take derivatives. We want to compare paths somehow. And to do this, we need a topology. The topology chosen by Bruno and we can, in other versions of the, of the calculus, was the L-infinity norm between two paths, so the sup norm. But paths, as I said, may have different time domains. So you take, for example, yt and zs, t here, s bigger than t, what you do, what what you should do here is to just flat extend the, the shorter path and compare those two. The red one here is longer in time and then you, with the flat extension of y and sum s minus t just to be sure to have a, a proper metric. And the flat extension is defined like this. You just repeat the last value continue, uh, constantly up to the end. So this path deformation does not change uh, does not create discontinuity, but the next one we'll see is the one that requires the Cadillac paths from the in the first place. So what is a functional? Like as I was saying, like the temperature of a certain location, the credit score, the price of a exotic option is a function of paths to R, or this could be generalized as well. And Using the metric we just defined, we can say what is a continuous or lambda continuous functional. functional. And the notion of, this notion of continuity is for, it comes to guarantee the proof of the functional ito formula, we'll see. And the main point of this, no, this notion of continuity is that uh, if you do like a, a and that's the main idea of the proof, to do this piecewise constant approximation of the path. So you go back to the standard setting of multidimensional Ito calculus, and you guarantee the, the good behavior or the convergence of this to the f of xt. And it was weakened like along the lines of uh, Obenhauser paper published in stochastic and dynamics. So this what like, this was what we saw, the path deformation, the flat extension, and it creates the, the time functional derivative, which is the comparison of the functional at this deformation minus the usual, the const, the, the not changed path, divided by delta t. Delta t here can only be positive. We cannot, we, we cannot change the path. We, it's a non-anticipative calculus. We don't look the whole path. It's just local deformation. So we don't change the past in any situation, and we don't look into the future. It's a dynamic calculus, different from Malia van calculus, where you have like the whole 
uh, time observed, and then you do the, the formation of the whole path somehow. And the main, I would say, the main derivative here, the most important one, is the, the correspondent of the Malia-Van derivative in this setting, is the space functional derivative, which compares the, the, the functional at this perturbed path, where the last value is just bumped by h, could be positive or negative, of course, and you compare the value with the, the old value divided by h and let h to zero. So this could be like different. You could still like constrain yourself in the realm of continuous paths, but you have to change this notion of derivative. There are ways of doing this, and but that's not what we'll follow here. So just to see if, if you understood, in the classical sense, when you are in the ethos setting, what, what does this derivative mean? So if you do a flat, a flat extension like this, it's like you're looking at this, what this functional mean first? So you're just taking the path, seeing the time domain, that's t here, and the last value is small xt. So for the flat, flat extended path, the time domain now is t plus delta t. We flat extended a bit. But the last value is still xt. We didn't change that. So you do this limit, and you find, of course, the usual partial derivative. And if you do this space derivative, you're not changing the, the time domain. It's still 0t. But you're changing the last value by h. So you find the usual uh, sp uh, partial derivative with respect to x of the function not functional, phi. This is good. We are really extending it to four, like uh, the usual calculus. Th there is no stochastic um, framework mentioned yet. So, but if you have like the running integral, for example, so the integral from zero to t, and this t is varying, and the path here, x u. So if you do the flat extension, you're adding like a rectangle here, of course. And you get the new area of this rectangle minus the area of under the curve before. And the area of the rectangle is just xt times delta t. Dividing by delta t, you get xt. And the space derivative, since here is just the Lebesgue measure, it doesn't change the area. Depending on the measure you put there, you could change the area. But it's just 0. Okay? This will be helpful understanding the implications in the quantitative finite framework. So without probability yet, so no Brownian motion, we say here, for example, that f belongs to C11 if it's lambda continuous with lambda continuous derivatives, delta t and delta f. And in this setting, with just any finite variation path, you have the usual uh, fundamental theorem of calculus in this infinite dimensional setting. So this is, it was obviously true from Bruno's paper, but it's good to mention specifically that even in the deterministic case, the theory like gives some like possible applications for people that don't know Brownian motion. And that's usually a barrier for some areas of mathematics. They do like optimal control. We have our stochastic op optimal control, but a lot of the researchers in optimal control, they don't go through the, the techniques of Brownian motions and they prefer to stay there. So maybe get this message out there could help develop the area in other directions. From the non Markov case. Yeah, from the non Markov case, yeah. So here could be no Markov in, in the optimal control sense in many directions, we'll see a bit of this. So the proof, it's, I, I stole this from Bruno, so this was in the, one of the first, like, it was on the talk from 2008, the, it's just a bit new, the, <coughs> the drawing of the path, but the, the idea is to compare, like, this you should think as a short path, but you could do, like, a longer path and just, like, splitting very short paths compared to the initial value. It's just what? The path minus this. So this is a flat extension and a bump. So this is continuity. Here you have the continuity plane that uh, the functional f k 
can be well the can be well approximated under like constant by parts functionals uh, paths. This is the bump, so this x derivative, and this is delta t. So you see here how the proof goes. It's really straightforward. You have to add some boundness or continuity assumptions to go forward, and you can weaken them and make it work in a in different situations. But the idea is this, and fairly simple. And but like that's the good thing about good ideas that they are simple. So how does it work in the our setting, the setting we are used to? So we need the extra derivative in x as we do in the usual setting. And only now we are fixing a probability space. Before that was only like paths. And you, you can go forward with no probability using this pathwise integration theory. And you can do a lot in this in these rough paths and you can generalize in a lot of directions here. But for any continuous semi-martingale, you can do discontinuous ones, no problem. And it's smooth functional, you have exactly the same form of the Ito formula, but with functional derivatives and paths. So it looks the same, it's not the same, but it has the same flavor. Okay, so delta t here is the functional time derivative, the space time derivative, the space functional derivative, and the twice the, the space derivative, and you have the quadratic variation. Okay, so once you have the Ito formula, the, what you can do is let's see whatever like people develop using the usual, the classical Ito formula, and let's see we can do if you can do something here. So the first thing I'll do is Feynman cats, and it's a bit different, and I'll show you how different it is. But the first thing I define is what Bruno called conditioned expectation. So you observe a path y, and after you observe this up to time t, you follow the dynamics of a given Ito process here. I'm choosing a and b. It could be functional dependent, the coefficients, and that's another interesting thing. If you look the books of the great books in stochastic calculus, like uh, Williams and Rogers, even like uh, Karatsas Reeve, or there are other uh, Prater as well, they all do the theory of existence and uniqueness of SD in the functional setting. And after that, they generalize for Markovian setting to use PDEs. So the functional Ito calculus from Bruno, it's a way of Okay, you don't have to go to Markovian settings to use P, yeah, you have to do to use PD, but you can go to keep the functional uh, setting and use what we call PPDs. It's a, uh, like a less friendly object, but still it's, it's a well-defined. So you follow from YT, you follow the dynamics of a given Ito process, and if you plug in here, the, the, the observe, uh, observed path from the Ito formula, you get the usual Martingale the condition expectation. And so given a Ito process, a final function on G and an interest rate or a discounting functional R, if you define this functional here as we defined before in the conditional expect ex expectation setting, that it means that yt is observed and from yt you follow the dynamics and compute this final payout here. If this function is smooth in this sense, then, and there are like other papers showing how this, how can you guarantee this function to be smooth? This will satisfy the PPD, the path dependent PD or the functional PD, which is exactly the same in terms of symbols as the usual PD from Feynman Katz. So, have the drift, you have the volatility, you have the discounting, you have the time derivative, okay? The different thing here is that y, the path y, needs to be in the topological support of the process x. In the usual setting, you still have this, but it's, since you're talking about random variables, it's much easier to discuss the topological support of a random variable. It's either an interval or like the whole real line, and it's much simple to find the PDE in a nice domain. Here we need this. 
it's the same thing as before, but because we are in uh, consideration of paths, we need this additional difficulty here. For most, like for if B here is well behaved, this topological support contains the continuous functions. So you still have the PPDE for all continuous paths, but to guarantee all the discontinuous paths a bit harder, okay? And it's a final value PPD, as George was mentioning in the, in the case of PD. Okay, the proof, and that's the beautiful thing of this, it's the same. You just define H to be this here, the discounted uh, functional, apply the Ito formula for H. You have to have a martingale here, so you set the drift equal zero, and the drift equal zero means the PPD. But the drift is equal zero over XT, and that's the main thing that I mentioned before. XT here is random, and you want this to be to work in a non-random setting, of course. And for continuity, if you have uh, this is equal zero over random paths, it will be zero over the topological support of these random paths. Okay. Another application: all these are taken from Bruno's uh, seminal paper. So another application, and this you have to confront with the clark cohn formula, is to find the, the, Martin -Gay the specific Martin-Gay representation uh, process here that writes any like a martin G, so I'm assuming A and R equal zero, so we are in the martin setting. X is a martin here. And G of XT for any functional G is an initial value, like the expectation, and the integral, the hedging, you could say, of uh, following the path of f, the price f, and trading x. So you, under like Malievan calculus, you can do this, but what you find here is not the delta t of f, so here is derivative of the expectation. You find the, the expectation of the derivative. So you would expect that the derivative of the expectation to be the expectation to be smoother, of course, you have a, a kernel going on here. But it's also harder to compute this because you don't have the formula, the specific formula for the f. While in the Malevon sense, you have the specific formula of the payoff, but it's usually non-smooth, and you have to do the the you have to do the take derivative, but you take the expectation later. Okay? The proof again is just the same, I'll skip for time's sake. And so what were the financial financial applications that Bruno showed in his paper? And I'll focus mainly in the first one, it's the simplest one. Is that so you have the usual dynamics, so here could be the path dependent volatility of uh, Guillon and Hobson and Rogers. And the risk the, the the risk neutral rate here could be, the interest rate could be path dependent as well. But the price of the option we know is this, as in the uh, Feynman -Katz, functional Feynman Katz setting we were considering. And the Feynman Katz is exactly this, the black and shows PPD. And the nice thing here is not to look at this and say, oh, it's just the same. No, this gives the correct path dependent Greeks, and that's important. So the correct Greeks, if you want to know in the functional sense, is delta t and delta x and delta xx. These are the correct notions of delta hedging, of gamma and theta, okay? So it's exactly the same as before, but with different meanings. So the, the, the trade-off is the same between those quantities, but those quantities changed, okay? The example showed in the paper was the Asian option. For example, if you have the running integral, uh, you find the, so the usual dynamics here, Mark Markovian, of course. So the Asian option, the functional, it can be written as phi of t, x, t, and i, t. And you increase the dimension. And you compute delta t of this functional. It's just the usual derivatives of y and of phi with respect to t and phi with respect to i. And the two derivatives of x is just the second derivative of phi with respect to x. This could, you could say, okay, that's just what we did 
like back before Bruno invented or created the the ito, the, ito, the functional ito calculus. But here you can understand that the theta of an Asian option is the time derivative plus the the i derivative. It's not just time derivative, and this is not part of the delta or part of the gamma. So the gamma is just the second derivative. So you still have the trade-off between theta and gamma. Here I'm assuming zero interest rates, but that's it, okay? I'm gonna skip this. This was the nail that Bruno was trying to hammer, but I'll have to skip because I want to show the, the work I did with Sami. So Sami and I were interns of Bruno, like this was 2011, I think, in, at Bloomberg. And we're working like on different things and we kind of converged to this computation of Greeks. Bruno was like the main contribution or like guide through this work here. And the idea, and this was, up to now everything was the same as in the, in the classical sense, but with a flavor of different and importance difference. But here you see and you understand the usual, the, the, the main difference between both the, the, the usual calculus, the usual ito calculus and the new one, the functional ito calculus. And it was funny because, so when I mentioned that Bruno and I were chatting in 2009 in Marizias, after that he sent an email saying, I have a conjecture, can a functional depend, a functional that, uh, we mentioned this here after, that this is zero, can this functional depend on the history or it has to be a uh, Markovian functional? And it has nothing to do with the computation of Greeks, it was a theoretical question. And I figured out an example I'll show that shows that it, this could be zero with, uh, with steel path dependence. So it's funny to see that that question that has nothing to do with uh, financial research question, quantitative finance research question, it became like a very important, uh, I don't know, characteristic of the functional ito calculus. So the Lie bracket of these two operators, and it makes sense to define it because they do not commute, as we'll see, is delta xt, so I'm not <coughs> following Bruno's uh, suggestion here, because you say delta xt, and x you say first, so it should be the first thing as the operator, but I'm following the, our i, so t is closer to f, so delta t is closer to f as well. So this is how those operators don't commute, and I will show you that they don't, because the main idea is that these things, they, they are comparing the functional here, flat extending and bump, and then bumping and flat extending, and not always this will, they, they, they will not be the same. So we say that they are weakly path dependent, if this is zero, if they do commute for this functional, at least over some set of paths. And the examples, the first one that we knew back then that the, it was the example that they don't commute is the running integral. We computed the delta t, delta t was just x, so delta x of delta t is one. But delta x was zero, so delta t of delta x is zero. The one that's weakly path dependent and it's clear from the, the usual theorems of calculus is h here should choose phi of txt. So this is clearly, it's path independent or depends on the path only in a one point, the end point. And so it's weakly path dependent. And this was the example I came up back then, it was 2009, something like this. And it's the double integral in the sense that the area here if you do a double integral, it vanishes too fast to be seen when you do the limit. So if you compute this, the delta t, uh, delta, f, delta x of delta t and delta t of delta x, you find zero. The other one that it's nice to see that it's weakly path dependent, at least for continuous paths, is the quadratic variation. I'm not discussing this or the ito integral. This could be functional too, but they are not usually continuous and would need a different treatment as the Obenhauser did. Harrow did. So, and this was uh, the usual functional you consider where the payoff depends on discrete times. And this payoff has a zero Lie bracket, it's weakly path, path dependent. 
but for the time still one TM. And this is nice compared to the results found by Fournier and his co-authors in 1999 to compute Greeks uh, not doing the derivative, which is, this, oh, okay, which is this result. So this was uh, one, of the, one of the main things we did was that delta x, the adjoint of delta x is the Ito integral was proved by Count and Fournier in 2013. And using this, we're able to prove that the delta of the functional f, it's actually just a weighted average, uh, the expectation over different, uh, with a different weight here. This was found by Fournier, another Fournier, the one from 99, using Malia van calculus. And functional Ito calculus, using that, we were able to understand why they had to consider this. Why it's important to have xt1, xtm, and not like, a, how can you consider the full dependence, or how can you add full dependence here? So it brings a lot of things in the, in the setting, and other developments that I didn't have time to mention was Viscot solution for PPDs was a huge body of papers by Tuzi, Zhang, and co-authors. Extensions of the functional formula, I mentioned some. And the recent thing I was working on is how to do optimal control with path dependence in the control, the control affecting the problem path dependently. And FITO helped too and brought like really new light to that. So I just want to add to happy birthday, Bruno. Thank you very much for your contribution. It was really nice working on this. Thank you guys. So we, we are out of time, but I'm gonna propose a forward swap with Bruno because everything is about his work anyway, so we can uh, lock in some questions now uh, for the time of your talk uh, later, the 90 minutes. Is that yeah. okay? Can we do a forward swap? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, so so uh, questions for either of the speakers. Yes. The what can yeah, you I say about weak path dependence of iterative integrals of the path with respect to itself? So, so yeah, the the, the so I would say yeah, I, I would say it's so the, the 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 usual integral, the stochastic integral of the path with respect to itself, it's it's it should be path independent, weakly path dependent, because it can decompose between the something that it's path independent and the Kodari variation. But if you're mentioning something like related to the, to the. Higher integrals. Higher dimension. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not sure. But I, I, would, I, would think, I would think it is, but I'm not sure. Could but the, the, the usual stochastic integral might not be path independent depending on what you're integrating. Yes, but, but when you integrate the path itself? Self, yeah, so for sure one dimensional it is path independent. Okay. But okay. multidimensional you have to think. Do you have any comments, Bruno? I, I think it's uh, the, the same as usual. Yeah. Because you know that every solution of a stochastic differential equation can be written as a functional of iterated integrals, so it would mean that every solution can be written by weakly path independent objects, which would be a nice ah, result. Yeah. yeah, that's true, yeah. But the, just a quick comment, the path dependency can be instantaneous. Yeah. So what happens globally at the current time. Or it can be actually, for instance, uh, de delayed. And uh, yeah. so the Lie bracket, so the fact that it's zero, which we call a weakly uh, path independent, uh, so means that there is no instantaneous yeah. path dependency. But a, a simple functional, for instance, would be the delayed one, it's the value of uh, some delta t time before. So it's clearly pass dependent uh, and it has a, a, a zero Lie bracket. Yeah. yeah so, so it means it, uh, it's another example which is yeah. pass dependent but not instantaneously pass dependent. Yeah. So the Lie bracket is zero. Yeah. Okay. Thank Other you. questions? Yeah. Oh, Raphael. Oh, I Sorry. think Jean Pierre is also. Okay, well, that's a question uh, more on uh, uh, George's uh, uh, talk. 
so well, the, the whole idea of the local volatility is precisely that the local volatility surface is the instantaneous object that may evolve through time, a bit like the forward yield curve is uh, for interest rates. So uh, the question is, when you see a set of prices like you saw, uh, you can fit a local volatility, but that volatility itself has uh, its own stochastic process, possible jams, possibly rough, etc. Um, the question is, uh, when you see a smile and you try to sort out what part comes from uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, volatility. So basically, you you try to retrieve what the volatility process, and here you have an uncertainty because the so smile can either be explained by stochastic volatility or by your behavior of the volatility with respect to 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 the to the to the strike. It's uh, the question of sticky delta or versus uh, uh, sticky strike. Um, now. Answers by Marco, for instance, were to say, well, let's try to find something that has the best fit, you know, that minimizes some sort of entropy. Um, Bruno, what do you think? I mean, if instead of that, uh, you would go to something that best fit the markets in the sense that it gives the best hedge. That is, uh, you know, what, is there a way to sort out uh, the the local volatility from its uh, from the stochastic volatility by saying it provides the best hedge for whatever exotic options or something. Yeah, okay, so first, if you're in a one given local volatility model, it already contains its own dynamics of the volatility surface in the, in the future. So for instance, if you have currently in market prices, you compute the local volatility surface, you can already sort of forecast within the model, if at a later time you are to give a later spot price, what would be the new implied volatilities? Because the local volatilities then will be still the same one you started from. So you can uh, re-aggregate them in the future to see the, uh, the new implied volatility surface. And uh, when, um, so it, it gives you, for instance, answers for the risk people who have to work with uh, assumptions what would happen if, uh, for instance, uh, next week the spot price is moved by a certain uh, quantity? So it gives you conditional, a set of conditional implied volatility surface. Now your question, I guess, is how is the market differing uh, from, from this? And, uh, and knowing that, uh, let's say, the baseline should be this local volatility uh, surface. And so the interesting thing, yeah, you mentioned the sticky strike and the sticky delta assumptions. I don't know if people are aware of it and probably we don't have really times, but the time to do it, but it's different scenarios uh, adopted by the traders to say, okay, if this spot move happens, I should have this new implied volatility surface. So one of the interesting results actually is that if you have no substance, basically no jumps, and if you have a deterministic model of how the implied volatility in the future will be as a function of the spot and time, it has to be the one coming from the, the, the local vol. One of the consequences of this, that if you don't have uh, jumps, then uh, you have um, uh, the fact that the implied uh, volatility, at, at the money volatility, should move um, along the, the, the local volatilities for, for the short term maturities. And basically, uh, it would have a sensitivity to the to the spot uh, position, which is twice uh, actually the current the twice the current uh, the, 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 the the twice the current skew. If it's not, if you are in a model in a in a market condition where it's systematically violated, like for instance, you have a sticky delta, so the spot price m may move, but uh, the skew moves similarly. If you don't have jumps, then it's totally arbitrageable by essentially buying the expense, the, the, the cheap calls and selling the uh, expensive puts and uh, delta hedging. Uh, it's something that has been done by, uh, by quite a few, a few people. Uh, this is uh, for the very short maturities for 
the, the ratio two does not hold for longer ones. Uh, Bergomi et Sogjain has popularized the notion called the stochastic skew ratio, which is the average uh, sensi sensitivity of the Adamant evolved with respect to, to the spot divided by the skew. And in the sticky delta, sorry, stochastic skew, so yeah, stochastic skew model. St skew stickiness ratio, sorry. Uh, and the sticky delta model tells you it's zero, sticky delta model, a sticky strike model, it's one, and uh, uh, sticky local volts, if you want, is, is two. So again, if for the short term, it's uh, observed uh, that it's uh, quite different from two, and uh, you have no, no jumps, it's, uh, it's arbitrageable. Sorry, it's a <laughs> long question, very long answer. Yeah, it was yeah. nominally a question for Georges. So yes, do you but want to uh, no, no, but no. I stand on the shoulder of a uh, giant. So um, <laughs> it turns out, no, let me just uh, mention no, one course. thing. Uh, since the question was to me, yeah, I, of <laughs> course. <laughs> perhaps I should. <laughs> um, the, the flexibility of looking into the convex regulari regularization setting that I just gave was in particular that you can put a very, very uh, wide class of, uh, of functionals for regularization. So in principle, you can certainly devise a, a way of um, uh, minimizing your hedge risk as a regularization part. Uh, you can also include the entropy, and that's where, when, again, you have to go beyond a quadratic regularization. If you don't do that, you are stuck here, sorry. And, uh, and so, so again, functional analysis plays a, a big role here, and you cannot uh, overcome it, uh, even if you say all the words about sticky, 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 and, and <laughs> so, so my point is, uh, you can perhaps, and, and actually the framework that uh, Marco Vigianeda uh, developed back uh, when he was looking into the minimization problem of the entropy is related to this uh, setting also. It's just that uh, he, he didn't put regularization. That's why you see in his graphs a tremendous amount of uh, roughness. Yeah, yeah. 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 but, but uh, so the answer to your question is you definitely can include that, but uh, if you want to prove some mathematical theorems, you better know, you know where you are working. So, quick question for sure. Yuri. Okay. Um, so maybe a question or clarification, clarification and must, this must, must be quick. Um, I'm thinking about your last slide about optimization uh, problem and uh, uh, what you were mentioning, nonlinear problems. The, let me, can you clarify that w in what you presented, you need a semi-Martingale context? Uh, mm. For instance, yeah. uh, what I have in mind is that you cannot allow ah, the yeah. volatility to be yeah, fractional. Right. Yeah, okay. so Good. yeah, the, everything here shown was in the constant context of like uh, the usual ito calculus, you can generalize along the lines people did in the with Maliavan calculus and other techniques, but it is a, would be a different type of generalization. And the nice thing regarding the the function, the rough volatility or like any uh, any process that has itself the path dependence within the context of the process is that the, re regarding the path dependence, you don't have to change anything. You see what I mean? You have to incorporate the fact that it's not a semi martingale to the theory, but you don't have to deal with non path dependent, with path, yeah, with the path dependence, because this is taken care of for the whole theory. So there is a new, I didn't mention here, there is a new paper by uh, John Feng and someone else I forgot that they do the the they they deal with this uh, with the possibility of uh, fractional Brownian motion in a very very clever way, but he they add a diff another like a process to keep track, which is the expectation of the future of the what you're observing up to now. So you do with those two. Those, like when it's a martingale, you get the usual thing. When it's not, you get new things. It's a uh, easier calculus than what you see with these uh, things that Nualah, Davi Nualah did that 
you have to have, I don't know, h up to 1 fourth, otherwise it doesn't work. You have, you keep adding like assumptions. In this setting of jump thing, you don't have, you don't need that, but you add a variable. So, yeah. So we'll take one more short question and. <laughs> Hey, hi. So that's a question for Yuri also. Okay. So in, in practice, like lots of traders don't use Eto function and calculus to calculate Greeks for exotic options, right? Uh, so have you have you ever tried to look at what your Greeks would be like using Eto functional and what they use and try to compute differences of hedges? So I I, I think I think they do use at least the delta, okay. the bumping at the end. They do use that. The, the theta, the, the time, but they, they don't use that to hedge, of course, but they, they don't, th that was my main comment in the Asian options. I, I'm not completely sure, but my guess for my experience that they don't know the correct theta in the framework. But the delta, the bumping at the end, that's how they compute nowadays. And that was one of the comments that bringing like ideas from the trade for to like stochastic calculus. So the delta hedge to see comparison in this sense, it would be the same. If you want to compare the, compute the delta of uh, Asian option, they, they've done that before. But I don't know if they use, if they want to know the risk of the whole portfolio of options, they're probably computing the, the theta wrong there. That's probably what's happening. Thank you. Okay, very good. Now we are very uh, uh, out of time. And before I relinquish my chair responsibility, because the, everybody who was in the morning session are organizers, I'm gonna make a request on behalf of the audience that we reconvene later, yeah. not uh, mm -hmm. on schedule, but I will leave it to you to decide when we Should reconvene. Be. No, no, but uh, we are still in a democracy and uh, <laughs> it's accepted. Uh, so the question is just what time is it now? It's about 11, so four to 11. So let's shift the morning thing the starting time for 11.30. Right. And, uh, and Bruno, since uh, you... Uh, but you have a picture now. Yeah, there's yes, a picture we'll now. Yes, go for yes. the picture yeah. now, yes, okay. definitely. Very good. A and then, Bruno, uh, the settlement of the forward uh, yes. swap that <laughs> you have with uh, Mateus doesn't involve a margin call on my side. <laughs> okay. Very good. So with that, thank you very I'm much. I'm not a collateral. And, and let's thank all the speakers. Okay, thank you.